this government is committed to ensuring we have a high quality police force. We have the men and women, we have to give them the tools, and we are providing the tools. In, I have to continue to mention the investment in physical facilities because, Madam Speaker, we allow our police stations to really run down as a country. Yes. Policemen were, hosted, were housed in old great houses and they stayed properties in some rural areas. They took over principal cottages in some of the areas which were run down. They took over the upstairs of parish council buildings which are allowed to run down. I mean, the one in Savama, I refer to all the time when all the boys on the veranda, half of them rocked out and the police cut the, the desk in between and a few spaces. And hopefully, the police officer, the female police officer, though we were hiding, she was upstairs. <laughs> dropped to the floor before that. Over the past year, I spent significantly in improving the quality of the workspaces for our police officers. The job is not complete, but we have done over 121 out of the 186 facilities. The government has ensured partnership with the National Housing Trust to make a social investment fund, and of course, the budget consolidated fund itself. So we have built seven fit for purpose police stations across with GSF and refurbish a number. In HG has been several, and we are targeting this year alone a further 15 at a cost of some $500 million. NHT will construct five new stations, Froome in West Poland, Little London in West Poland, La Cove in St. Elizabeth, and Chove in St. James and Stone Hill Police Station for them. In addition to that, through the council, this part government is our taxpayers' money, we are completing the development of a forensic pathology autopsy suite for the first time. In this will complete the build out of the Institute of Forensic Science and Legal Medicine and we'll have one of the finest institutes capable of serving not only our own country but even the region. It will have the best quality available. We, have come, we are in the process of completing the procurement for the West Berlin new headquarters and I'd like to show, take a look at what we are putting up in West Berlin divisional headquarters. That's a police station, not a whole building that was being used for Busher office. We are also putting up a St. Catherine Divisional Headquarters, which will be the new headquarters for the new area. And again, take a look at that. And Madam Speaker, I urge the members to take a look at these two pictures because, you see, I might be able to complete my entire presentation, but these two pictures are what we intend to do in West Berlin and St. Catherine reflects the thinking of this government about the police. These are modern professional centers, efficient, functional, user-friendly, and customer-friendly. Adequate working stations for professional men and women of the Jamaica Council. Yes. This is we're building a nice professional force. We treat our policemen well. Right? That's what we're doing. We know the big elephant in the room, you know. We talk about compensation. But I know the Minister of Finance, in his efforts, will fix that problem to the satisfaction of the policemen. And I'm going to start a public negotiation. I know it will be settled in favor of the police security forces and they will be satisfied at the end of the day. He has his time to do it, and I allow him to go through. But I understand the policy, and it will be the interests of the officer. So we are come taking the steps to do what has been promised for years, and not done. We don't promise, we deliver. In fact, I don't think the Minister of is saying the security force has put on their own line because it was very difficult to recognize the efforts of security personnel. Not just the police and army, and the specialized jobs they do within the global pictures. So they have had to be given their own set. That is something that has been talked about for years. And look at odd how things were done, it's created problems. Now we are putting a systemic, organized structure that will allow them to function and negotiate as a team. 
and it will take them to the right place and can't win due course. There are some people who like to create mischief by indicating bias between different arms of the security services. Not this government yeah. does not indulge in that kind of pity. Yeah. Um, activity, right? Petty nonsense. Look at the amount of resources. And you know, the people who are talking about 16 billion dollars. The level of investment that we have made in the security. Never. 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 I want to say two things on this. I said two things on this. One, we dis when we debate, the state of crime the country deserves the objective analysis and debate. We took government to a stage when the difference between the JDF and the JCS was a fine. JDF is at single base. Harrison, we had to, we couldn't move quicker than that. Much has been done to improve not only the JCF leadership and management so that we can introduce a structured program of investment over time to bring it up. We have also had changes in the Ministry of National Security itself because it was not one part of government, Ministry of National Security was treated as second cousin, as your spokesman would say. The entire security apparatus, in fact, it would be fair to say that in the government that served between 2012 and 2016, the police force was defunded. Absolutely. Literally defunded. Exactly. What do they say? What do This government has taken an approach completely different. Yeah. Not the same. No, this government is the government approaching our security problems with objectivity <laughs> and investment. <laughs> right? Among the changes, Madam Speaker, we look at establishing a police fleet. Not by vehicles up and down, of 1,500 and maintaining them. Into the SUVs, cars, pickups, buses, and motorcycles. We made a point repeatedly that the high level of recruiting in the JDF that increased the JDF by thousands was really a misallocation of resources. The priority should have been to increasing the number of police officers. A budget is a statement of priorities. And when you examine the budget of the Ministry of National Security over the last seven years, what you will see is that the JCF has been treated as the poor cousin of the Ministry of National Security. And, and let me tell you why I say that. First of all, the capital budget for the Ministry of National Security has been between twice and three times the size of the combined capital budgets of the Ministries of Health and of Education. In my time, we, the most we ever got in our capital budget was a little less than $2 billion. I know those of us who joined here in the 70s and 80s remembered a time when the regiment was deployed. It was in the back of PWD dump trucks, um, vehicles borrowed from the Ministry of Agriculture. Um, those were the vehicles that we had. Now, as I look around, um, I see lots of resources. The Ministry of National Security under Minister Chang has got as much as $20 billion in one year, 10 times the maximum I ever got. But it's not just because I'm jealous, but can you imagine what the figures would have been like if I had a half of that? But when we look at how it has been allocated, that's where the concern comes. So, for example, during that, period, during that period between 2014-15 and 2021-22, the recurrent budget increased from $50 billion 
to just over 80 billion. Now let us drill down to the JCF and the JDF. In that time, the JCF's budget, recurrent budget, increased by a third, about 33%. The JDF's recurring budget increased by over hundred percent. Three or four times the percentage increase that the JCF had. When we look at the capital expenditure side specifically, the JDF's capital budget peaked at over twelve billion dollars. The JDF, the JCF has not got even half of that. Almighty God, the source of all life and resources, we thank you for this occasion where we can receive additional resources to boost the fleet of vehicles that we already have. The transformation process of the JCF continues in earnest. We seek your grace and blessings in all our efforts. We appreciate the close collaboration with JCF with its parent ministry the Ministry of National Security and ask that the synergy that exists will continue to redound to the effective implementation of our mandate as we seek to provide peace and safety to our nation. We now seek your blessings on these 40 specially fit for purpose vehicles. Thanks to the Ministry, the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of National Security and the Ministry for investing once again in building for us a better, more capable police force. We have 47 Mitsubishi L200s here that will deploy from here all over the country to support our citizens. These pickups have been modified to make them more fit for purpose uh, for policing. And all of this is about rolling out a robust, very aggressive process of modernization. So consistently, the JDF gets more than twice the capital budget allocated that the JCF has. There is a sense, um, CDS, that the government of Jamaica has spent significantly on the JDF and that the real expenditure should be focused more directly on the crime situation, which would ultimately mean uh, a greater focus of the resources, if not all the resources, on the JCF and the other law enforcement agencies. Of course, a review of Jamaica's budgetary expenditure on security would show that we have quite a balanced uh, use of resources across all our security forces. But what is not generally understood is that the JDF plays a supporting role to all our security operations. 
and there is scarcely an area in security where the JDF is not present in some ways. And in fact, in building out the capacity of the JDF, you are building out the capacity of your border security, you are building out the capacity for your internal security, you are building out your capacity for disaster response, you are building out your capacity for managing your airspace, you are building out capacity for managing your cyberspace. Investing in the JDF is investing across all areas of security for Jamaica. And that is a point that needs to be made over and over and over again. There is a perspective that is in the minds of Jamaicans, less so now than before, that somehow we have our soldiers ensconced at a park camp and not in the field. That is not the report that I have. The report that I have is that the JDF is stretched right across the island, carrying out all kinds of functions. Uh, they are sometimes the unseen protection. Uh, and our forces are fully utilized. And aside from the reports that I receive from the National Security Council, uh, you know, as I move through the country, I do meet up on soldiers who, they are not complaining CDS, don't get me wrong, they are not complaining, but they, they point out that they are on such long duties. In other words, they want me to know that they are very hard working, that they don't always get the time to go home to their families, that they are on call for long durations. And that is the case, obviously, of a soldier. And our soldiers are being fully utilized. We have a duty, therefore, to provide them with the equipment such as these to ensure that they can function. Uh, CDS, not in comfort, I'm not proposing that, but that they can be efficient and effective in doing their duties. Though these vehicles look like they will carry you in good comfort through rough terrain and give you the protection necessary. These vehicles actually will add significant capacity to our disaster response capabilities. But they also give us increased visibility and presence in communities that are now challenged with high violence and crime. Armored um, troop carriers have been a part of the JDF's arsenal since the mid-1970s. In an effort to modernize our fleet, in 2013, we commenced the transition from the Cadillac Gage Commander V-150 armored personnel carrier to our present fleet of Thales Bushmaster protected mobility vehicles. The acquisition of the additional PMVs was a natural step given the forces no island-wide disposition. They will provide us with the increased capability to deploy PMV units within the respective geographical commands to enhance the effectiveness of the troops on the ground. As outlined in our recently published Strategic Defense Review, the expansion of our PMV fleet is a key element of our capability development efforts. The fleet of PMVs will improve our flexibility of the land forces as they conduct operational activities across the island. While the vehicles have proven to be a critical force multiplier in internal security operations, they are also critical to other land operations such as search and rescue in post-disaster situations or other scenarios. The PMVs are a key component of the JDF's commitment to being fit for purpose now and in the future. So they do serve a critical purpose. Jamaica's capacity to secure its borders has been strengthened with the acquisition of a new surveillance aircraft as well as two helicopters and a new hangar for use by the Jamaica Defense Force. Reach them! Always make sure the message I reach them! I feel a great sense of pride this morning. And this is starting as we commission the newest 
additions to the JDF air wing fleet. The very first maritime patrol aircraft in Jamaica, two of nine 429 Bell helicopters that will certainly enhance Jamaica's capabilities. And it marks a single largest investment that any government of Jamaica has made in the area of security. And it marks a transformation in our approach to intelligence gathering and maritime security. Concepts such as border security may not be as familiar to the average man on the street. However, it is this very aspect of security that ensures that we can actually address the issues of crime and violence within our communities. In September, in my address to the UN General Assembly, I reinforced Jamaica's commitment to building a secure environment through combating the illicit traffic and trade in small and light arms. This starts with securing and enhancing our borders. These investments in the aerial capabilities of the JDF are a further demonstration of our commitment and plan to secure Jamaica and its resources for present and future generations. The acquisition of the maritime patrol aircraft will enable Jamaica, which has a maritime space 25 times its landmass. The ability to increase its maritime do domain awareness, facilitate search and rescue and maritime interdiction. This is a critical component of the vision of increased security for Jamaica. So, as a result of what I consider an ill-advised and badly skewed expenditure, the force strength of the GSEF has, on average, actually declined up to the end of last year. I don't know what it is, the number is, as we speak now, and I know a lot of efforts are being made to build the recruitment capacity. So whereas, despite the massive increase in budget allocations to the ministry, the number of police personnel has at the in the last year was about what it was five years earlier, just below 12,000, well below the establishment of 14,000. In the comparable period, the JDF enjoyed a huge increase in both the approved establishment and in the actual strength of soldiers. And this ex what I consider excessive spending on the JDF, while not correspondingly increasing the strength or capacity of the police force, treating it as a poor cousin of the ministry is one of the reasons we've had a challenge in reducing the murder statistics, the very violent crime statistics. I know those of us who joined here in the 70s and 80s remembered a time when regiment was deployed, it was in the back of PWD dump trucks, um, vehicles borrowed from Ministry of Agriculture, um, those were the vehicles that we had. Now as I look around, um, I see lots of resources. The GDF or soldiers cannot do the work that police officers can do. I'm happy to. Soldiers are neither trained or equipped to do the work that police officers can do. And I have no problem with soldiers being used in support of policing, but they cannot be used instead of policing. Which is why we directed our budget to increase our Coast Guard capabilities. Never before in the history of Jamaica has the capabilities of the Coast Guard been so increased and we're seeing the results of that. We have created 
um, the maritime air and cyber arm of the JDF, which is to be able to control, as I've said, uh, those spaces. And uh, we have increased our budget to the JCF. Uh, never before mm -hmm. have you seen so many police stations being repaired, rebuilt, or built new um, equipment, technology. So I don't think the public questions whether or not the government has placed the resources into the fight against crime um, and creating the national security cover for the country. And that was done under Plan Secure Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that for the years of underinvestment in national security, the criminals have built up capacity in firearms, in organization of gangs, in control of communities, and in the financial resources, the means to commit crime in some areas of Jamaica in an almost unchallenged way. Mm. And the crime, as I've said on many occasions, it is over and above, not the capacity of the police. That's not uh, the accurate term. It is over and above what policing is designed to address. Mm. In other words, if this level of crime existed in any other society, the police in those societies would have a challenge. Mm. Because what we are seeing borders on terrorism. What we are seeing is a deliberate attempt to drive fear into the population, deliberate attempts to undermine the state, to corrupt the state. Uh, and, you know, it is interesting that a part of the testimony that came out in some of the trials of the gangs uh, is that the gang leader saw the murder rate going down and gave instructions that they must increase the rate, they must go and kill more people. So there is intelligence behind the criminal activity that is taking place. So the regular law enforcement methods are not going to immediately bring down the level of crime. So let's look at what are regular law enforcement methods. Let's look at what we have done with the interdiction of gangs. Now again, never before in the history of Jamaica have we seen so many gangs being brought through our regular system of policing, meaning that we investigated, we arrested, we put together the cases, we brought the evidence before the courts, and we went through a trial. And that process could take two years to interrupt the gang. Uh, and you have over 100 gangs operating with the limited resources of our investigations and dynamic operations to go and interdict and arrest and so forth. So you see the magnitude mm -hmm. of the problem. So we are investing in regular policing in order to maintain public order. So I want the, the country to understand that, that we are not saying that regular policing can't work. That's not what we're saying. Mm -hmm. We're saying that regular policing is designed to address a certain type and nature of criminal activity. But when the criminal activity that we have now reaches to the point where it could threaten the very existence of the state, it requires a different response from the state. It requires the state to arrange its resources and strategies in a different way in order to address that threat that is diminishing the assurance to the citizen that they would be able to enjoy their life and freedom and their assets. And I'm saying that that arrangement requires uh, certain powers to be given to the state. Commissioner of Police, Major General Anthony Anderson, and Chief of Defense Staff, Rear Admiral Antoinette Williams Gorman, have aligned themselves as symbols of collaboration to introduce a joint anti-gang task force as efforts to curtail crime continue.
Major General Anderson says extensive and thorough planning has gone into bolstering the effectiveness of the initiative. He says emphasis has also been placed on cross-training security officers, that is, providing police training for soldiers and military training for police personnel. This is expected to birth enough rounded security officers fit to execute the special operations that will be executed by the task force. He says there has also been training for sub-officers to prepare them to lead these groups. These uh, sub-officers are also, you know, physically they are, we tested them at military standards and they met those standards uh, pretty well. And so we have a cadre now that works with the JDF and can seamlessly do this work. And hence, we're seeing those sorts of results, uh, which is what we want. Chief of Defense Staff Rear Admiral Anthony Weems Gorman concurs that the task force will be intentional and relentless in its pursuit of criminals.